And I want to give a special thank you to two of my University of Alabama students, Josh Koble, who is uh, DMA. He's going to help us demonstrate some of the techniques. And my other student, Christopher Henley, a sophomore this fall um, at the University of Alabama, that he will also show some of our, our different ways of practicing. A disclaimer first. <laughs> the Surefire Practice Techniques <coughs> sessions contains suggestions and renders that, that will hopefully re improve and render your practice sessions more efficient and productive. However, it is not the final word. Okay? Every musician has his or her own preferred methods of practice. Some techniques covered here will work well for you and less well for you as well. Um, and I would encourage you to invent creative new ways to practice. Okay? Introduction. Here's a little bit of an introduction. First of all, I, I did enjoy my little quote that I found up there. When Pablo Casals, then age 93, was asked why he continued to practice the cello three hours a day, he replied, I'm beginning to notice some improvement. <laughs> <laughs> there are no shortcuts to learning repertoire. Okay, get that down. There is a reason why we say music is a discipline. Okay, you must be disciplined. The goals of complete musical understanding and technical perfection, if there is such a thing as perfection, <coughs> can only be realized by developing intelligent methods of study and practice until they become habits. Every experience you have ever had is encoded in chemicals and stored in your brain. The brain is hardwired to operate on habit. Establishing good habits is crucial because we carry the bad habits for a lifetime. It, they are encoded in the, in the chemicals and stored in your brain. New habits never really replace the old bad habits, but rather they displace them and make them less prominent. And pursued long enough, new habits become stronger than the old habits, but any backsliding in the new habits and the old ones will re resurface. According to educational research, there are four components of self-regulated learning. And that's what we do, right? Practice by ourselves, usually. And so there are four components of self-regulated learning that are especially important for ac a great academic performance. One, or A, I think you have it on your sheet, metacognitive strategies for planning, monitoring, and regulating cognition. Simply put, this means that the student has the ability to plan, monitor, and regulate his or her learning activities through self-awareness of cognition. B, you must have uh, management and control of effort and concentration. C, there must be specific cognitive strategies such as your rehearsal strategies, elaboration and organization of your material. And D, and I think this is the most important one, it is success in learning depends, learning new music depends on self-efficacy. Oh, what's that? <laughs> Simply stated, self-efficacy means that the student knows what needs to be done to accomplish his or her <coughs> goals and has the perseverance, drive, and motivation to follow through even in the face of failure. I have to say, I was, I was asked um, a month before a performance to learn the Duraflé Requiem. And I had to have it ready in two weeks to accompany the choir on the piano. Now, fear can be a great motivation, <laughs> of course. <laughs> um, I also just, just most recently uh, was asked to do the orchestral reduction um, within a month's time period for the Rayfon Williams Benedicite. I did use these practice techniques and learned that. I learned at the same time I learned I was going to be doing the, uh, with a five part brass choir, the Gigou Grand Corps Dialogue. And I, so I learned that in a week on the solo version first. And then I went back and learned it with the, with the brass. But, um, and I performed it in a week. So you, you really, even if you feel like, oh, I'm daunted, this is a daunting task, it's overwhelming, I can't do this. You have to overcome that and have the drive to push through it. It's, it's you know, somebody once referred 
called me the you know the little dogs that have the the little rat terriers and that you take the glove or whatever and they're shaking it and then their teeth you have to be that persistent okay and and the other the other thing about self-efficacy is the student must possess the ability to assess progress all right there are some eternal principles and techniques to utilize during your self-regulated practice. So, eternal principle number one, keep your practice fresh. Avoid mechanical, unthinking practice and repetition. Five minutes of mindful, brain-engaged practice is far more productive than four hours of mindless drilling. Five minutes better than four hours of mindless drilling. Mix up your practice techniques. Try to read your body. This is that self-efficacy thing. Read your body. What do you need to move your music from here to here? Try practicing in shorter segments, such as 30 minutes, no more than an hour, maybe three to four times daily. Stop and rest, carefully reading, maybe, and thinking through a section of study. Avoid hasty practice. Oh, I gotta get this done. I gotta, you know, just play through it and you know, madly, you know, stopping and starting. Um, avoid that. Keep your tempo slow until your mind, hands, and feet can negotiate the notes. Two, practice immediate. If you're taking lessons, um, practice immediately after your lesson while things your teacher said to you are still fresh in your mind. Three, try to avoid playing incorrect notes from the very start. Remember that about the habits. You start a wrong habit, a wrong note. It will, I've had students, they will come, you know, lesson after lesson will have circled the note and it will not, the next lesson it won't be changed. That it then becomes just terrible to try to break the habit of playing that note, relearning a new one. Um, so if, but if you do play a wrong note, complete the phrase, then repeat the passage correctly several times, okay? Um, also, you might try uh, stopping on the corrected note and saying the name of the note aloud. Um, but the caution is, I've had students where they will stop every time they make a mistake, fix it, and then move on, make a mistake, fix it. And that is a habit that is also the stopping and starting and fixing that is really difficult to break. Four, build tempo after your phrases and sections of a composition have been mastered at a slow tempo. Return to slow detailed practice of phrases that are not yet solid and repeat this procedure in subsequent practice sessions. Five, Always practice at a steady tempo. Don't take the easy passages fast and then the slow, pa the hard passages, you know, really excruciatingly slow. Find a tempo that you can take it at one steady tempo. Six, uh, pr place brackets around the difficult passages and devote most of your time to these sections. Don't just start at the beginning of the piece and go to the end, beginning to the end. That is about the most inefficient way to practice you could ever do. Seven, practice in segments. Stop and rest at the first sign of tension. Get off the bench, raid the refrigerator. Do something active away from the console. I told Christopher here the other day, I said, yeah, I just bought a new lawnmower. I'm gonna go out and mow my lawn after I practice. And I you do something else that's, you can even think about the music while you're doing it. But, but get out there, be active. I think some of us just sit too much anyway. So do some active things. Um, and think about the music away from the console. Eight, once the notes have been learned, register the piece and begin practice pushing the pistons. These are muscle skills that we have to do. So pist pistons are just as important and it's a learned skill for our hands and feet. Drawing stop knobs, um, opening and closing the swell shades. Uh, you, I've had students, you know, well, we waited to do the swell shades until they had all the notes learned. Well, once you put in the swell shades, it's like they forgot how to play the piece then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so any mechanical devices that you need to be operating, rehearse those as early as possible to help master those necessary motor skills. Nine, practice on consecutive days. 
generally you cannot skip a day or two of practice and make it up on day three with triple the practice time. Uh, practice in consecutive days, uh, if you don't do that, <laughs> results time lost and that equals notes lost that you spent so hard learning. Ten, practice the score uh, with the score but away from the organ. Sit on the couch, anal analyze the score, study it. Eleven, play your music for others and solicit comments. Persons who are not musicians may offer fresh insight. However, keep in mind, not all comments are appropriate, so be discerning. <laughs> and practicing, as you, you may have discovered, practicing alone in a practice room is totally different from practicing in front of someone. All of a sudden, either nerves kick in, uh, it just becomes a whole new experience. So get used to it. Play your pieces in church. You know, break them in there. That's a great way. Twelve, avoid distractions. Turn off your cell phones. <laughs> yeah. When your focus deteriorates, change your place of practice. For instance, like I said earlier, move to the couch or, uh, you know, and study your score. Do something different. Okay, now we must have a practice management plan. And uh, you can set your goals and manage your practice time. These might include determining um, a final tempo mark. Listen to recordings. Get your tempo marks that you think you would like to uh, have the final product be. Mark it on your music. You could do a, a checklist, and I gave you one on page three. Um, prepare a practice checklist or a diary or a log, a weekly practice evaluation, and devote on this evaluation, devote a specific amount of time for technique, uh, learning new music, memorizing and polishing music, and the sample, as you can see, actually uh, shows you, I, it, this is kind of, you know, just a sample, so it's not what maybe you would do, but um, it's an idea. So we're, we have Sonata in D minor, Schmieder number 527, and on day of April 15th, we use the metronome, slow practice, rhythms, temp different tempi, backwards practice, um, and we did the manuals, scales, and pedal scales and arpeggios, and we did an hour's worth of piano practice, okay? Then the next day, you see we deviated a little bit, because why? This is all part of keeping your practice fresh and realizing what your body and your hands and your feet and uh, mind need next, okay? That's self-efficacy again. Getting ready, the score preparation. All right, mark your fingerings. I just can't stand it when a student comes in and the music, except for the black notes on the page, it's white. There, you're, that probably means, there's a good chance it means that the fingers are learning different jobs every time they go through and play the piece. Do you realize how inefficient that is? <coughs> It's just, it, it's excruciatingly painful to me to watch this. And so at the University of Alabama, I make fingering assignments. And in this generally, we finger, uh, our choices are based on economy of motion, that principle of economy of motion. A few days before their next lesson, students will hang copies of their fingered scores on my bulletin board. And yes, I go through every note and check their fingerings. At the next lesson, we'll ha and I'll hang them back up. I'll hang the scores back up on the board. They come and retrieve them, bring them to their next lesson, and we have a fingering lesson, or, an, or we review portions uh, that could have Im more improved and uh, more e economical fingering. Don't just take the time to finger, then do it. <laughs> That's the next step, because they'll, they'll, then they'll throw it, the baby with the bathwater out, and they will not have observed any of the fingerings that they painstakingly wrote down on the music. Use them. <laughs> okay. And when you, when you take time to mark those in, follow the fingerings and pedalings you've marked. If after, though, a week or so of practice, you find out and that's diligent practice, you find out that they're not quite working, go ahead and change them. Okay, life is too short. 
So don't struggle and, and but you you know do diligent practice first before you decide to alter anything you've taken time to mark. Once you do have the, the final fingerings and pedalings, don't deviate and use the same ones now forever until maybe well there's our there's an exception. The exception would be if say ten years down the road you decide to resurrect that piece and you all of a sudden you had an enlightening moment and or your hands had changed or you know you, your technique had changed there's all kinds of things and you might might change things but you probably wouldn't have to refinger the whole piece um, this kind of fingering and pedaling works well in early music or in just modern music all right warm up your hands and feet daily you have manual scales, you do those on both piano and organ. Pedal scales, do them. Arpeggios, do them. Organ and piano. And use your technique books, Cherney, Hannon, uh, there's the Brahms Etudes, some Chopin. You can do those things, they really will help your technique. My, my saying that all my students know what I say, it's, I guess I coined a phrase, remember a great technique is a straight jacket that sets you free. It's true. If you have a great technique, you can, you can actually play any music, no matter the difficulty. I believe that. Okay, E, learning the notes. Generally, the following numbers, one through six, are easier for beginning organists. Numbers seven through 14 are more advanced techniques, but this does not mean that one through six can be used by only beginners and they can't do seven through 14. Okay, you, they use all of them alone or in combination too. So the, the first seven or, or six, you probably know many of these, you know, hands, do hands alone, do feet alone, hands together, left hand and pedals, right hand and pedal, then all parts together. It, that makes logical sense. Okay. So the other thing you can do, number seven, is select odd registrations in each hand to bring out the lines. Like, oh, try a mutation, <laughs> two and two thirds, and maybe an oboe, and uh, maybe a little forgot on the pedals, or, or something just really bizarre. Just, and see if you can play without you know, it really will mess you up, especially the mutation, because <laughs> it won't be on the right pitch. But um, that will test you. But other times, you can, like number eight, you can try a four-foot flute for clarity and just go with that. You know, I walk in sometimes and the concert hall organ is just blaring. Oh, it sounds so wonderful. Ah, there's some wrong notes in there, student. And so, I make them practice on a four-foot flute, and you hear things so much clearly, clearer than, than on that massive planum that you've been playing on. Number nine, dotted rhythms. Does anybody here use the dotted rhythms? Good, 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 that's good. Do you know why they work? I mean, it's, I'll tell you, so uh, it, it, it actually, if you're doing a long short, and you're, you're doing it at a slow tempo, the, the accenting of a particular note with a specific finger ingrains that muscle memory into your hand. Then you flip the rhythms, and then the opposing alternate finger gets the accented note. And so, and it also keeps your brain fresh. You're not just always reading the notated rhythms as what's on the page, okay? 